Hello, I'm your instructor, Bernard Norcott Mahaney, and uh, for chapter eight, which deals with Apollo and Artemis, um, I thought I would um, add, add the following reading. Um, she provides as her Greek um, examples, Homeric hymn number 3b to Pythian Apollo and Homeric hymn 27 to Artemis. Um, which is fine, but the Homeric hymn number three is divided into two parts. The first part is about a third of the whole uh, hymn three, and the second part is the remaining two thirds. Uh, it is thought that these are two separate hymns. The style seems to be different, <laughs> and the first third has a clear ending to it, which makes it sound like you know, uh, there were two hymns to Apollo and they got mushed together to make one. Um, Maurizio, for whatever reason, probably for uh, space uh, in the book, um, you know, cut that out, but I rather like it. So the first part of Homeric hymn number three is to Delian Apollo, and it deals with Apollo's birth on the island of Delos. Apollo had two, sh two main shrines, one on Delos, the site of his birth, and the other at um, Delphi, uh, where the Pythian Apollo hymn is set, uh, where his, the, his oracle was. So, I'm going to read Homeric Hymn 3A, is how it's usually called, to Delian Apollo, translated by Hugh Evelyn White. And I found this on the Perseus website, which is a... Um, uh, a website from Tufts University, where they have um, older versions of translations of Greek and Latin works, so um, copyright is not an issue. Uh, and they're pretty good translations overall. Homeric hymn number 3a to Delian Apollo. I will remember and not be unmindful of Apollo who shoots afar. As he goes to the house of Zeus, the gods tremble before him, and all spring up from their seats when he draws near as he bends his bright bow. But Leto, alone, stays by the side of Zeus who delights in thunder, and then she unstrings his bow and closes his quiver, and takes his archery from his strong shoulders in her hands and hangs them on a golden peg against the pillar of his father's house. Then she leads him to a seat and makes him sit. And the father gives him nectar in a golden cup, welcoming his dear son, while the other gods make him sit down there, and queenly Leto rejoices because she bare a mighty son and an archer. Rejoice, blessed Leto, for you bear glorious children, the lord Apollo and Artemis, who delights in arrows, she in Ortigia, and he in Rocky Delos, as you rested against the great mass of the Cynthian hill, hard by a palm tree, by the stream of Inopus. How then shall I sing of you, who in all ways are a worthy theme of song? For everywhere, O Phoebus, the whole range of song is fallen to you, both over the mainland that rears heifers and over the isles. All mountain peaks and high headlands of lofty hills and rivers flowing out to the deep and beaches sloping seawards and havens of the sea are your delight. Shall I sing how, at the first, Leto bear you to be the joy of men, as she rested against Mount Synthus in that rocky isle in Seagirt Delos, while on either hand a dark wave rolled on landwards, driven by shrill winds, whence arising you rule over all mortal men. Among those who are in Crete, and in the township of Athens, and in the isles of uh, Aegina and Euboea, famous for ships, in E.G. and Eresii and Peperethus near the sea, in Thracian Athos and Pelion's towering heights, and Thracian Samos and the shady hills of Ida, in Skyros and Phocia, and the high hill of Autocane, and fair lying Imbros, and smoldering Lemnos, and rich Lesbos, home of Makar, the son of Aeolus, and Chios, brightest of the, all the isles that lie in the sea and craggy Mimas, and the heights of Coricus, and gleaming Claros, and the sheer hill 
of Esajii and watered Samos and the steep heights of Mikale in Miletus and coasts, the city of Meropian men and steep Knidos and windy Carpathos and Naxos and Paros and rocky Rhenea. So far roamed Leto in travail with the god who shoots, for, shoots afar to see if any land would be willing to make a dwelling for her son. But they greatly trembled and feared, and none, not even the richest of them, dared receive Phoebus, until queenly Leto set foot on Delos and uttered winged words and asked her, Delos, if you would be willing to be the abode of my son Phoebus Apollo and make him a rich temple, for no other will touch you as you will find, and I think you will never be rich in oxen and sheep, nor bear vintage, nor yet produce plants abundantly. But if you have the temple of far-shooting Apollo, all men will bring you hecatombs and gather here, and incessant savor of rich sacrifice will always arise, and you will feed those who dwell in you from the hands of strangers, for truly your own soil is not rich. So spake Leto, and Delos rejoiced and answered and said, Leto, most glorious daughter of great Chius, joyfully would I receive your child, the far-shooting lord, for it is all too true that I am ill-spoken of among men, whereas thus I should become very greatly honored. But this saying I fear, and will not hide it from you, Leto. They say that Apollo will be one that is very haughty, and will greatly lord it among gods and men over all the fruitful earth. Therefore, I greatly fear in heart and spirit that as soon as he sees the light of sun, he will scorn this island, for truly I have but a hard, rocky soil, and overturn me and thrust me down with his feet in the depths of the sea. Then will the great ocean wash deep above my head forever, and he will go to another land such as will please him there to make his temple and wooded groves. So many-footed creatures of the sea will make their lairs in me, and black seals their dwellings undisturbed, because I lack people. Yet, if you will but dare to swear a great oath, goddess, that here first he will build a glorious temple to be an oracle for men, then let him afterwards make temples and wooded groves amongst all men, for surely he will be greatly renowned. So said Delos. And Leto swear the great oath of the gods, Now hear this earth, and wide heaven above, and dropping water of Styx. This is the strongest and most awful oath for the blessed gods. Surely Feeble, Phoebus will have his fa fragrant altar and precinct, and you he shall honor above all. Now, when Leto had sworn and ended her oath, Delos was very glad at the birth of the far-shooting lord. But Leto was racked, nine days and nine nights with pangs beyond want. And there were with her all the chiefest of the goddesses, Dione and Rhea and Ichnea and Themis and loud-moaning Amphitrite and the other deathless goddesses save white-armed Hera, who sat in the halls of cloud-gathering Zeus. Only Ilithia, goddess of sore travail, had not heard of Leto's trouble for she sat on top of Olympus beneath golden clouds by white-armed Hera's contriving, who kept her close through envy, because Leto with the lovely tresses was soon to bear a son, faultless and strong. But the goddess has sent out Iris from the well-set isle to bring Ilithia, promising her a great necklace strung with golden threads nine cubits long, and they bade Iris call her aside from white-armed Hera, lest she might afterward turn, from her, turn her from coming with her words. When swift Iris, fleet of foot as the wind, had heard all this, she set to run, and quickly finishing all the distance, she came to the home of the gods, sheer Olympus, and forthwith called Ilithia out from the hall to the door and spoke winged words to her, telling her all as the goddesses who dwell on Olympus had bidden her. So she moved the heart of Ilithia in her deep breast, and they went their way like shy, wild doves in their going. And as soon as Ilithia, the goddess of sore travail, set foot on Delos, the pains of birth seized Leto, and she longed to bring forth. So she cast her arms about a palm tree 
and kneeled on the soft meadow while the earth laughed for joy beneath. Then the child leapt forth into the light and all the goddesses raised a cry. Straightway, great Phoebus, the goddesses washed you purely and cleanly with sweet water and swathed you in a white garment of fine texture, new woven and fastened a golden band about you. Now, Leto did not give Apollo, bearer of the golden blade, her breast, but Themis duly poured nectar and ambrosia with her divine hands. And Leto was glad because she had borne a strong son and an archer. But as soon as you had tasted that divine heavenly food, O Phoebus, you could no longer then be held by golden cords nor confined with bands, but all their ends were undone. Forthwith, Phoebus Apollo spoke out among the deathless goddesses, The lyre and the curved bow shall be ever dear to me, and I will declare to men the unfailing will of Zeus. So said Phoebus, the long-haired god, who shoots afar and began to walk upon the wide-pathed earth. And all the goddesses were amazed at him. Then with gold all Delos was laden, beholding the child of Zeus and Leto, for joy because the god chose her above the islands, and, sh and sure to make his dwelling in her. And she loved him more, even more in her heart, blossomed as does a, a mountain top with woodland flowers. And you, O Apollo, god of the silver bow shooting afar, now walk on craggy Synthus, and now kept wandering about the islands and the people in them. Many are your temples and wood wooded groves, and all peaks and towering bluffs of lofty mountains and rivers flowing to the sea are dear to you, Phoebus. Yet in Delos do you most delight your heart, for there the long-robed Ionians gather in your honor with their children and shy wives, with boxing and dancing and song. Mindful, they delight you so often as they hold their gathering. A man would say that they were deathless and unaging if he should then come upon the Ionians so met together. For he would see the graces of them all, and would be pleased in heart, gazing at the men and well-girded women, with their swift ships and great wealth. And there is this great wonder besides, and its renown shall never perish. The girls of Delos, handmaidens of the far shooter, for when they have praised Apollo first, and also Leto and Artemis who delights in arrows, they sing a strain telling of men and women of past days, and charm the tribes of men. Also, they can imitate the tongues of all men in their clattering speech. Each would say that he himself were singing, so close to truth is their sweet song. And now may Apollo be favorable and Artemis, and farewell all you maidens. Remember me in after time, whenever any one of men out on earth, a stranger who has seen and suffered much, comes here and asks of you, whom think ye, girls, is the sweetest singer that comes here, and in whom do you most delight? Then answer each and all with one voice, He is a blind man, and dwells in rocky chaos. His lays are evermore supreme. As for me, I will carry your renown as far as I roam over the earth, to the well-placed cities of man, and they will believe also, for indeed this thing is true. And I will never cease to praise far-shooting Apollo, god of the silver bow, whom rich-haired Leto bear. So that was Homeric hymn number 3a to Delian Apollo. Uh, that c concluding part that is clearly a conclusion where the singer turns to the uh, maidens of Delos and says, if anyone comes asking who's the best singer of all, tell them that it's this blind singer from Chios. And it is from that particular passage that we have the tradition that Homer was a blind poet from Chios. Okay, so that's where that sort of idea comes from. That and the fact that in the Odyssey, uh, there is a blind poet named Demodocus, whom some people think is Homer doing sort of a Hitchcock turn, where he's sort of inserting himself into the text. Um, but we have no evidence that Homer was blind or that he was from Chios but he does seem to likely be from the Greek islands, given the particular dialect uh, that is prominent in his, uh, in his uh, poetic uh, language. So, um, again, I hope that you enjoyed it. At any rate, now at least you've got the other part of Homeric Hymn number three, uh, the part to Delian Apollo.